it's good to be with you all in worship today. My name is Joe Scavato, and it's just an honor to be able to share the Lord's Word with you today. A while back, I think it was around somewhere in my middle school years, I remember going to a restaurant for the first time without parental supervision. That was a big deal for me, and I remember it was after church one day, and a bunch of my friends and I, we all convinced our parents to let us go to the fanciest restaurant we could think of, Red Robin. And you laugh, but as a middle schooler, any place with bottomless fries is, you know, that's the promised land right there. So we were so excited. We walked all the way to Red Robin one day after church, and we sat down, and we felt so cool. We were there, no parents anywhere around us, and we were just having a great time with it. Our waiter came, and you would have thought by what we ordered that we hadn't eaten in days. Like, we were having these burgers that were, like, as big as our faces, and fries, and appetizers, and desserts, and it was just a feast. We were having an amazing time. At one point, we tried to convince our waiter that it was like three of our birthdays, like to get free desserts, like you might think we're triplets or something, and uh, somehow that one didn't work, but it was still just, it it was awesome. We were having so much fun, and then something weird happened at the end of our meal. Our check came. And, And suddenly, this amazing plan that we had and this perfect lunch wasn't so perfect anymore, and we found ourselves a little bit unprepared. You see, I had brought some money with me, and it was enough to cover a normal person's meal at Red Robin, but I hadn't just eaten a normal person's meal. I had a whole lot more, and so I'm just kind of like scrambling a little bit, and I wasn't the only one. We were all kind of a little bit nervous. Suddenly, those onion rings we had ordered just to have an onion ring fight didn't seem worth it, which at the time, it it was, it, you know, it was still worth it. Never mind. Um, but, but at this point, we're kind of, we're freaking out a little bit because we don't know what's going to happen. We've heard that, you know, they make you wash dishes if you can't pay for your meal. And I don't want to, I don't even wash dishes at home. I'm not doing it for you. Like, we're, we're freaking out at this point. And finally, one of our friends shared that he had just gotten, um, it, was, it had just been his birthday, so we had actually some extra money. We convinced him to, that we would all pool our money. And somehow, by the Lord's provision, we had just enough to cover our check, plus a tip of eight cents. I know, I'm a terrible person. I understand it. And even then, we felt so, so terrible that this poor waiter who had to deal with these obnoxious, wild, and rowdy boys, he deserved a generous tip and, and a hug, I think. He needed a nap after dealing with us. And instead, he received such an awful tip of eight cents. That was the day that I learned that the things that we prize in life often come with a price. The things that we prize in our lives often come with our price. That's what we're going to see today in our story of the book of Ruth, as we've been going through this journey of these two women. This this woman, Ruth, from from Moab, and her mother-in-law, Naomi, they've been through so much, and the Lord has taken them from Moab back to Israel. And he's done some incredible things in their lives, and they've met this man named Boaz, and he's given them these blessings, and and things are looking up, and it's just this incredible thing that they're having. And then last week we learned that Boaz didn't just want to give them blessings, he wanted to redeem their family. He wanted to marry this woman, Ruth, to start a new family, to come in and just do everything that they could imagine and even more. But there's one obstacle left. There's one man who could do what he wanted to do before him. And so we're going to pick up our story today in Ruth chapter 4, and it's going to be on the screen. But let me just read a few verses for you, starting with verse 1. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat down there just as the guardian redeemer he had mentioned came along. Boaz said, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So we went over and sat down. Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and said, sit here, and they did so. Then he said to the guardian redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so, but if you will not, tell me so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. I will redeem it, he said. Then Boaz said, on the day you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this, the guardian redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. 
Now, in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. And then verse 8, so the guardian redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself. And he removed his sandal. Our story today is one that is all about redemption. This process of redemption that Boaz is choosing to go through. This process of redemption. My wife Judy and I met in college and shortly after we started dating, she asked if I wanted to join her for a 5K color run. And if you've never done a color run before, never heard of one, that's kind of what it looks like. So it's, it's this idea where you run a 5K and if that's not punishment enough, people throw this powdered paint at you throughout the race. So I know, it sounds awesome. Uh, and so, so I really didn't want to do this, but my Judy did, and I wanted her to like me, so I agreed. And so we, we signed up to do this 5K color run. And I think we have, yeah, so that was a picture of us at the end of the race. And we look all happy, and we're smiling, and, and we're all healthy and all that. Yeah, this picture is a lie. Okay, this is a, a, a this is, and I'm sorry to lie in church, but that is a lie. <laughs> so we're smiling, but but I just want to say this with all the respect in the world for any of you that may be runners, but running is the worst. <laughs> and I, 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 if that makes us enemies, I apologize and I respect you, but I cannot think of a worse way to spend a Saturday morning than running a 5K, and not just running a 5K, but there are people sitting in lawn chairs along the path laughing at you as they throw paint that gets caught down your throat. Like it was just, it was the worst experience ever. At one point I was like trying to protect Judy and I was like, no, don't get her. I'm just kidding. I was pushing her in front of me. Uh, <laughs> I know it was bad, but, but so we were going through this and it was just the worst time ever. But finally we, we got through this race. I hated every minute of it, but finally we finished this race. And then I realized something. I realized that my car keys, which were in my pocket, were no longer in my pocket. And everything of value that I owned, my, my phone, my wallet, my school ID, everything that Judy owned as well, were locked in our car without my car keys. And so we were looking around and somehow I knew it was the paint thrower's fault. I was like, they made this happen. But so I literally had to go through the process of retracing my steps. And even though I didn't want to do one 5K, I found myself doing my second 5K of the day and I was, people were still throwing paint at me somehow. I don't know how it was happening, but it was just the worst day ever. And finally, about halfway through the race, I found my keys. We went back to my car. We took that picture and pretended like we had a great time because that's what you do when you post stuff on social media, right? <laughs> It was a terrible day. We've been going through this book of Ruth, and it feels like Boaz is kind of weirdly in a similar place, where he's going through this process, and he's doing things that maybe he doesn't fully want to do, but he's doing it in order that he will get what he prizes the most, this relationship that he wants, this place as a guardian redeemer. And we've talked about this before, but if you've forgotten or if you need a reminder, the, this guardian redeemer, you needed three qualifications to be a guardian redeemer. At first, you had to be a relative to the family. Second, you had to have the resources to pay for any property or, in this case, land that Naomi was selling. And third, you had to desire this relationship to start a new family, to carry on this family line, which was so important in those times. So those are the three qualifications, and Boaz was willing to do all three. And yet last week, we found that there's one man who's a closer relative that could take away legally everything that Boaz wanted to do and he could lose everything. And so I wonder if there's a part of Boaz that didn't even want to go through this process of redemption. I wonder if he wanted to just maybe do things a different way. We don't know much about this other man, this unnamed redeemer, but it doesn't sound like he's fully aware of the situation. It seems very likely that Boaz could have simply married Ruth in quiet and bought this land in secret and done things in a way that there would have been no risk to him to lose what he wanted. And yet that's not what we see in our story. That's not what Boaz chooses to do. There's significance in everything that Boaz did. In verse one, when he goes to the town gate so that everything will be done in public. In verse two, when he, re when he recruits 10 elders to be witnesses, which would ensure that everything will be done with integrity. 
in telling this unnamed man everything that he could receive to negotiate in good faith. And in verses 7 and 8, as we see this exchange of a sandal, which as our story mentions, was the legal way of fulfilling a deal. And just by the way, if that is the way that we could still do deals, that sounds awesome, right? Like I I could have just given Judy's parents a sandal and we would have been married. That sounds perfect. (laughs) Our wedding was still great. Um, (laughs) but, But it's fascinating that Boaz makes this choice to do everything the right way, to do it with honor. I know most of you didn't come here for a deep dive into Levitical law. So let me just summarize by saying that Boaz did everything to the letter of the law. He did it with integrity. It's as if Boaz makes this choice of saying, God, even though this is what I want, I want this relationship, I want this redemption, what I want more is to be obedient to you. I want more to be obedient to you than the things in the world that I want. This willingness to enter into this process of redemption points to the very thing that God is doing in this world. You see, everything that we see in history from creation to the cross and then looking ahead to the second coming points us to God's process. This process to redeem what he has created that has fallen. To be faithful where we have failed. To do what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, to reconcile the world to himself through Christ. All of this happens because God was willing to go through the process. This process of patience and grace and forgiveness. And our role in all this is simply what Boaz shows us. Obedience. Obedience to trust in God's plan, in God's will, and in God's way. To trust that everything that he is doing There is no length that he will not go to to bring redemption into this world. But not just in this world, but into your life, into your pain, and into mine. This obedience that Boaz shows us leads us to what's probably the happiest part of this entire book so far, the promise of redemption, the promise of redemption that we're going to see. When Judy and I did get married, and we had to do a lot more than exchange a sandal, um, someone volunteered to take a video of the wedding for us. And part of what he did that day was go around to different guests that we had invited, and he, ha- he recorded them giving relationship advice to us, kind of marriage advice. What would you say to the happy couple? Maybe some of you have been a part of that before. And overwhelmingly, it was really meaningful to watch it weeks later when we got the video, but overwhelmingly, one of the biggest things that we heard was, don't go to bed angry. I don't know how that became our like, go-to marriage advice in the, this world, but it did. And it, it was so overwhelming, and so many people had told us that, that our entire first year of our marriage, we were terrified to go to bed angry. Like, we, whenever we were in a fight, like, we would stay up to like 2 a.m., not making any sense. She was crying. I was crying. We, it wasn't even effective anymore, but we were so scared because like 175 people told us to not go to bed angry, so that must mean something. Now, I'm sure there were other things that people said to us. I'm sure that wasn't the only piece of advice. But I don't remember the specifics. You see, what I do remember is how important it was that our marriage started off with this blessing. It started off with the people in our lives that knew us, that cared about us, that loved us, investing in us, praying for us, and being there for us in this powerful way. And that's what we see in our story here too. That's how Ruth and Boaz's lives started together. Let me read verse 9 for you. Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, Today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Malon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, Malon's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from his hometown. Today you are witnesses. And then verse 11 says, Then the elders and all the people at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the family of Israel. Now, if you need a reminder, Rachel and Leah had the 12 sons that became the 12 tribes of Israel. So they were literally like the mothers of this nation. That was the blessing they were wishing on them. We keep going. It says, may you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Now, those were kind of like the the county and the city. So it's this idea of having standing, of having fame, of having honor in the entire region that they were in. 
And then verse 12 tells us, through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman. May your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. Now, that's a crazy story that we don't have time to go all the way into. If you want to read it, it's in Genesis 38, and it's a wild one. Um, But it's this idea of Tamar and Judah having this completely dysfunctional and messed up and weird relationship. And it's filled with sin and mistakes and weird decisions. And and it's just a, a crazy story. And yet through that, God uses it to have a son, Perez, who became the ancestor of a man named Boaz. It's this idea that God can use any relationship, any situation for his redemptive purposes. That is the blessing that they received. And you can almost picture this as as they're celebrating and as they're honoring. You can picture Boaz's excitement, the excitement of a groom on his wedding day. As he declares to this community, as he declares to the people exactly what he is going to do. And it's everything that we were hoping for as readers. Throughout this story, we're hoping for Ruth and Naomi to have this happy ending. And here comes Boaz declaring that he would redeem what seemed irredeemable. But there's something even bigger going on in this story as well. As this elders and community respond to Boaz with the blessing that is far greater than don't go to bed angry. It is something that is just so much more than they could have ever expected. It's this blessing to have children, which Ruth was unable to do in her first marriage. It's this blessing to have honor and fame in the area. That word famous that we read is interesting because it's often translated as to be proclaimed or called out. It's this idea of Boaz and his family being an example, being proclaimed to all those around them and to future generations. Something that they would have never expected as recently as a couple of chapters ago. This is a huge blessing that they begin their union with that looks forward to what God is going to do next week as we finish up the story. So what does this story today, though, teach us about the promise of redemption? We can learn from Ruth that redemption takes us from being the outsider, from being the foreigner in a new place, from being someone who doesn't feel like they belong, and giving them a home, giving them a family, giving them community. And it's that community, that family that we have, that gives us strength in the difficult times of life, and that celebrates with us in the good. What about Naomi, though? What can we learn from her about the promise of redemption? This promise of redemption takes us, man, look at Naomi's life, from pain, from bitterness, from loss, and from hurt. And it promises restoration. It promises new life. We know many of us here have felt that restoration in different areas of our life, but maybe there are some here today that need to hear this truth, that that same redemption That same restoration that came to Naomi is available to you. It's available to you, not to promise you an easy life, but to promise that everything that you go through can and will be redeemed one day. Redeemed by the one that has paid the price for you. And that's the core of this story, this price of redemption. The price of redemption. I want to just take you back because we skipped over a few verses a little bit, and I want to just close with this idea. Verse 5, let me read it for you. Boaz said, On the day you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this, the guardian redeemer said, Then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. And then skipping ahead to verse 8. The guardian redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself. You see, this is the moment that this entire journey has been building to. We don't know much about this other man, as I mentioned. If this were Ruth the movie, he would be this like stereotypical villain that you can't wait to see lose. And maybe he was that, but it's just as likely that he was simply a man looking out for his own family. And he's faced with this dilemma, this dilemma that I was faced with to a much smaller scale back in my middle school years at Red Robin a price that we were not prepared to pay, a price that is greater than anticipated. Think about what these two guys were being asked to do. 
They were being asked to buy this land that hadn't been worked in years, to invest money to make it workable, to marry this foreign woman, Ruth, and to give her a child and to start this new family, and on top of that, to add another mother-in-law. Some of you are like, man, that last one, that's all I need. I'm out. (laughs) He decides that the cost of redeeming Ruth is just too high, more than he was prepared to spend, and he bows out. See, it makes no logical sense to say yes to this idea. And that's what makes it so incredible that Boaz did that. You see, what this man saw as a loss, Boaz counted as gain. His actions paint the picture of a man who is willing to pay the price for the thing that he prizes, this relationship, this redemption. This is the difference between Boaz being remembered forever and this other man being forgotten in history. There's no price or obstacle that's going to keep him from redeeming this family. You see, we've seen Boaz do incredible things in this journey, in this story. And yet this is by far the greatest, and it points us to the one who came to redeem, who is willing to pay the price, not just for one family, but for each one of us. You see, just like Ruth, we are all in need of someone to pay the price for us. It's nothing that we can earn. It's nothing that we deserve. It's something that is freely given to us by Jesus Christ. There's nothing that we can do that will make him say, no, the price is just too high, and you are not worth it. Except too often we believe that. We believe that we don't deserve this love, and so we don't pursue it. And yet what this story and what this journey that Ruth has been on wants to teach us is that Ruth did nothing to deserve this. She had no money and no status. There was nothing that would have led her to believe that this is what her life was going to end up with. And yet he did it anyways. He did it anyways, and that teaches us, that points us to someone that it's not about deserving it, and if it was, we would all be hopeless. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. It's this love that Paul writes about in Romans 8, verse 38, when he says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. That is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You see, when we understand this love, when we understand who bought us, what we were worth, and how we are viewed, everything changes. A few years ago, I went to a mission trip to the state of Georgia, um, and we were working with this organization that serves the homeless population in Atlanta. And part of what we would do on this trip is that we would go out each day, and we would simply walk the streets and make new friends. We would go introduce ourselves to people and hear their story, and then we would invite them to this dinner that this ministry would have every night. And so I remember this first day of our trip, we went out, and we were walking through this park, and we we walked past this guy, and this guy, you could tell by just looking at him, that he had seen a lot of life. He was kind of an older guy, but still like super strong looking, and he was just covered in tattoos. Anything you could think of, skulls and devil horns and inappropriate words and inappropriate pictures and just all of it. Like, he was just this guy that if you saw him, you probably wouldn't want to talk to him. And I kind of didn't either, but we were on this trip. So we went up to him and introduced ourselves, and he had this big smile on his face. And he said, hi, my name's George. And we said, George, it's great to meet you. Do you want to join us for this dinner that we're doing at this ministry? And he just started laughing. He said, man, I'm already involved in that ministry. I'm coming. You guys better make something good for me. And again, he was kind of a scary guy. So he was, okay, George, you got it. And, and so we went on with our day. And I remember going back and we started helping out with dinner. And I remember sitting down and starting to eat. And I'm just sitting there eating and talking to people. And out of nowhere, this massive tattooed forearm comes around and puts me in a headlock. And it's George trying to scare me. And succeeding to scare me. I was screaming. I was terrified. And he laughed again. He was having a great time. And then George sat down and he told me his story. He told me about his life. He told me about how he had been born into brokenness, about how he had experienced just incredible pain, about how he had made mistakes, turned to addictions, and how his life had gotten to the point where he felt like he was worth nothing. And then he kept going. And he told me about how this ministry had come into his life and through the power of food and dinner and and clothing and shelter, they had started to show him about the love of Jesus. About how they had told him that there was a God 
who had sent his son to die with George in mind. And at this point, it's just the two of us, everyone else had already left, and I was just sitting there just absorbing everything he was saying. I was in shock. And then he he turned to me, he said, Jim, he thought my name was Jim. (laughs) It wasn't Jim, it's still not. Um, But but I was too scared to correct him, so I I was Jim. (laughs) And and he said, said, Jim, it's my birthday. And I was like, okay, it's kind of a change in subject, but you know, happy birthday, George, That's, that's awesome. And he said, Jim, you don't get it. Every day is my birthday. Now, George had been out in the sun for a while, and it was hot. So I was like, it's like okay, no, it's not. You just get one. That's how birthdays work, George. <laughs> and, and he said, no, you don't get it. You're not following. He said, every day is my birthday, because every day I know and I have this gift of knowing how much I'm worth. Now, you're not going to hear a better sermon than this big, scary guy covered in devil tattoos gave me that day. Many of us, if we looked at George, we would say that this was a man who had nothing. His life was hard and it was still a mess even after he came to know the Lord. And yet because George knew who bought him, how much he was worth, and how God saw him, he had everything. What about you? What would change in your life if you knew who bought you? how much you were worth, and how God sees you. What would change if you saw, to paraphrase Timothy Keller, that you are more sinful than you could ever believe and yet more loved than you could ever hope? If you realize the depths that God went to to show you his love, his grace, and his goodness, what would change for you? Would you stop believing that you just aren't worth it? Would you stop believing that you don't need anyone else's help? Would you stop believing that God has abandoned you where you're at in your life? I don't know what would change for you. But what I believe for each one of us is that we would realize, just as George taught me, that if you have been purchased, that means that you are prized. And that is something worth celebrating. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you for this incredible gift this willingness to go through the process, to give us this promise, and to buy us with this price. God, we praise you that you were willing to do that with us in mind. And we believe that if we have that, then we have everything we need. And so, Father, I ask that you would show each one of us what it means to live a life knowing that we are prized because you have purchased for our lives. We pray this all in your name. Amen.